Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this beautiful Sunday morning, June 22nd, 2020. This is the first full day of summer 2020. Oh yes, this is Collapse Chronicles. I am Sam Mitchell. This is my little co-pilot, Sancho Panza, getting ready to figure out what job to do on this gorgeous summer day in 2020. I think we're going to go to keep building Stonehenge fire pit out in the backyard. So we're looking at, I think, the low to mid 80s in uh, the Finger Lakes of New York. So what is it looking like on the first day of summer in the Arctic? We're going to go hundreds of miles north of, uh, of New York, above the Arctic Circle on the first day of summer 2020, <clears throat> where the Arctic records its hottest temperature ever, ever. Alarming heat scorched Siberia on Saturday as the small town of Verkoyansk reached over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what, somewhere around 40 degrees Celsius, which is 32 degrees above the normal high temperature for the first day of summer. 32 degrees. If verified, this is likely the hottest temperature ever recorded in Siberia and also the hottest temperature ever recorded north of the Arctic Circle. There you go. We have a new record set on the very first day of summer 2020. Guys, we are in for a rocket ride this year. Uh, the town is further north than even Fairbanks, Alaska. Okay, a little closer to home uh, on Friday, which would what that would be the last day of spring 2020, the city of Caribou, Maine tied an all-time record at 96 degrees Fahrenheit and was well into the 90s yesterday. To put all this into perspective, the city of Miami, Florida has only reached 100 degrees one time since that city began keeping temperature records in 1896. Now, of course, Miami, Florida very well could be blown away by a Category 10 hurricane. Verkoyansk is typically one of the coldest spots on Earth. This past November, it reached nearly 60 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. <clears throat> Reaching 100 degrees in or even near the Arctic is almost unheard of. Uh, and of course, as a result of the hot and dry conditions right now, Numerous wildfires range nearby and smoke is visible for thousands of miles on satellite images. Yes, this heat is not an isolated occurrence. Parts of Siberia have been sizzling for weeks and running remarkably above normal since January. May featured astonishing warmth in western Siberia where some locales were 18 degrees Fahrenheit above normal, not just for a day, but for the entire month. As a whole, western Siberia averaged 10 degrees above normal for May, obliterating anything previously experienced. So that is how we are starting out uh, the summer above the Arctic Circle and uh, 
as I've already mentioned before, uh, anybody who doesn't understand the link between that story and this one, you need to do your homework. Putin calls fuel spill unprecedented for Russia. Greenpeace sees $1.4 billion damage. President Vladimir Putin said on Friday the scale of the cleanup operation after a huge fuel spill in the Arctic was unprecedented for Russia, with Greenpeace estimating the environmental damage to waters in the region at $1.4 billion. A vast fuel tank lost pressure on May 29th and unleashed 21,000 tons of diesel into rivers and subsoil near the city of Norilsk, an incident which has been compared to the devastating 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill off Alaska. And it will take at least 10 years to recover. And uh, of course, the reason that this is related to that first story is what collapsed the fuel tank was the melting permafrost uh, in the Arctic, in Siberia, as the permafrost, the the very term permafrost has become a sick joke, and is more and more of this permafrost holding up. Good Lord, can you imagine oil refineries, pipelines, highways, railroads are all dependent on the permafrost foundation. It's like this house that I'm in. You lose your foundation, everything collapses. This will not be uh, the last story like this you're going to read uh, here when it's 100 degrees uh, above the Arctic Circle. This is the, this I've been saying for years that this the threats to this infrastructure, particularly the oil infrastructure, you know, the entire Alaska pipeline is, is dependent uh, on a solid foundation. And as the permafrost melts, all of this crap is going to be collapsing. This oil spill is going to be a little drop in the bucket compared to what's coming down the pike. Anyway, but we're going, as long as we're talking about things melting, uh, glaciers and everything else melting, there's been a lot of stuff recently. Several of you have been wanting me to cover this uh, dispute over there between China and India up there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, where I guess this big brawl erupted on this fuzzy border, you know, India and China both claiming this land, which would just look like a bunch of ice and rock that no one should care about. A bunch of soldiers killed each other and stuff, and uh, tempers are flaring between India and China over this area. And you're probably, well, why would anyone want this? Okay, it is not oil, it is not gold, it is water, what this is all about. This fight is ultimately about water. Galwan Valley Water turned China-India dispute fatal. The, sp the dispute between China and India turned fatal this week along one of the world's most important water reservoirs. This is called, this is a water war going on uh, today on this planet. What would drive the soldiers of two nuclear powers to kill each other with sticks and stones in the ice and snow of the Himalayas? Water water, and it is likely to get much worse. 
Yes, New Delhi and Beijing have been scuffling amid mountain peaks and, ba and valleys for more than four decades. This week, the dispute turned fatal. The proclaimed cause of the spat is the location of the de facto border between the two nations, you know, that they both control. Uh, they're both claiming it's them, but, but the reason they care is, uh, is the water. The border sits astride one of the world's most important water reservoirs, and it is draining fast. The Siachen Glacier is the largest single source of fresh water on the Indian subcontinent. It also happens to be situated high in the Himalayan mountains, straddling an uncertain junction between India, China, and Pakistan. Uh, it has been dubbed the world's highest battlefield. India, China, and Pakistan, all three maintain permanent military positions there. Okay, and what is this all about uh, from, this, from this particular glacier originates the Nubra River, which joins with various other tributaries and the Galwan Valley before merging with the Indus River. More than 200 million people rely on water from this one source. The Indus feeds the world's most extensive system of irrigated agriculture. By the time the river reaches the sea, humans have tapped more than 95% of its flow. Um, and so anyway, as this is, this is a long involved story, uh, then, of course, what they're talking about here, I'm just going to summarize it. Uh, now you, so you already have climate change hammering this. So you get, you, you've got all, all of this going on at once. You have climate change drying it up. You have this, uh, the population of India is going to surpass that of China pretty soon. You have overpopulation. You have climate change. Uh, and now China as it goes in here, is diverting more and more and more of these waterways, you know, that flow into other countries. And they talk about how they're doing this with the Mekong River and the headwaters of the Mekong, all of the countries downstream from there, and India, about how more and more they are uh, diverting the water obviously, to keep it for China. And uh, this is why World War III could very well be a water war. Let's go over there from China to uh, Sub-Saharan. No, this is not Sub-Saharan Africa. This is the northeast corner of Africa where Ethiopia, to fill disputed dam, Deal or no deal, yes, it is a clash over water hmm. that Egypt calls an existential threat and Ethiopia calls a lifeline for millions out of poverty. Just weeks remain before the filling of Africa's most powerful hydroelectric dam might begin intense talks between the countries on its operations have yet to reach a deal. Do you think so? Ethiopian Foreign Minister Gedu Andragashu on Friday declared that his country will go ahead and start filling the $4.6 billion Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam next month, even without an agreement. Yes, quote, for us, it is not mandatory to reach an agreement before starting 
to fill the dam. Hence, we will commence the filling process in the coming rainy season. So there you go. Uh, from India and China to Ethiopia and Egypt. You know, fresh water, the battle over fresh water is going to be uh, as these uh, doomsday prophets have been predicting, uh, it's not going to, who was it who made the, who first made that famous quote about the next world war will not be over oil, it will be over water. It is he who controls fresh water from uh, here on out. I must say I am thrilled to report here on Bugs on in a jar farm, I am uh, having a little too much fresh water. Uh, I highly recommend the Finger Lakes in New York. If you are looking for a fresh water paradise, I have two wells, how, I don't know how many springs on this property. I now have a pond. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to die of is lack of fresh water here in Ithaca, New York. Uh, anyway, anybody thinking of where to move in the end times, come see me at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Uh, but we do have one, let's do end on one positive note here in the mainstream media today before I head out to Stonehenge. China's population growing pains are its biggest challenge. And so I read this and I thought that this is from the national interest with a headline like China's population growing pains are its biggest challenge. I thought that this was going to be an article about overpopulation in China. No, this is the latest, you know, one of these uh, BS stories about the underpopulation challenge of China, that the birth rate is plummeting in China, even though they've abandoned the one-child policy, people are just sticking with it and the population of China is falling. And while it's going to keep rising, they say for a few more years, it's going to peak in 2029 and then start falling. And uh, they, let's just read the, this is a long involved article <clears throat> about why Chinese people need to breed more. Yes. Here is what you need to remember. China's demographic contraction will reduce its GDP growth rate as well as its ability to fund its foreign ambitions such as the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Yes. The party's social compact will also come under increasing pressure as economic growth eases. I bet. Um, China's seemingly inexorable rise <clears throat> has hit a roadblock. Demographics. And despite desperate efforts to reverse the effects of the Communist Party's one-child policy, experts warn it may be too late to prevent lasting damage to the Chinese economy by the declining birth rate. Uh, hallelujah. So anyway, we do have a, a ray of good news here. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap up uh, today's little doom and gloom roundup and enjoy this absolutely gorgeous <clears throat> second day of summer 2020 
in the Finger Lakes of New York. So if you enjoyed this little snippet of doom, please spend a few seconds uh, thumbing up this video, and we'd love to have you subscribe to Collapse Chronicles, and we'd love to have you come visit at Bugs in a Jar Farm to see for yourself what uh, a fresh water filled paradise looks like in the 21st century. Yes. Are you ready to get some chippies like that? Get out there and enjoy this beautiful summer 2020 while you still can before a heat wave kills you or a category 10 hurricane whatever coming our way. <clears throat> Bye guys. Did you hear a chippy like that? Nope. Why don't you jump off that table? Crazy dog. <laughs>